You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the History of the Second World War, episode 181, The Fall of France, Fall Gelb. This week, a big thank you goes out to Quantic Potato and David for choosing to support the podcast by becoming members. You can find out more over at historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members. German plans for an attack in the West would originate in the last days of the fighting in Poland. With the Polish military clearly defeated, units began to move to the west both to defend the western frontier, but also to begin preparations for an attack. On October 9th, Hitler would issue Directive No. 6, which stated that the goal of the upcoming German attack was to, quote, defeat as much as possible of the French army and of the forces of the Allies fighting on their side, and at the same time to win as much territory as possible in Holland, Belgium, and northern France to serve as a base for the successful prosecution of the air and sea war against England, and as a wide protective area for the economically vital Ruhr. It's worth pointing out that these initial goals did not speak of the defeat of France, only the capture of the Low Countries and then pushing the French back away from the Ruhr region. The planning by the German general staff would then be based around these objectives, But those initial plans would not be the plan used by the German military in May 1940. Instead, the plan would evolve from a relatively conservative plan from late 1939 into the bold thrust through the Ardennes that would eventually be executed. This episode is going to look at that evolution before discussing the German forces available for the offensive. This period of German planning is a great example of how quickly some of the German planning came together early in the war as the final German plans for Fall Gelb, or Case Yellow, would be developed starting in mid-February 1940, giving them just weeks to formulate these plans, after scrapping essentially all of the earlier planning in pursuit of new and bolder objectives. The result of this change and the quick reorientation of German plans would catch the French completely off guard, a surprise from which they would honestly never really recover. When the first draft of an attack on France was written up in mid-October by the German general staff, the results were very conservative, bordering on a bit boring. At a high level, the plan was to attack the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg, with the primary point of German effort being the forces that would march through the center of Belgium and towards Brussels. The attack would then, using a concentration of most of the available armored forces, push southwest towards the River Somme. This was not designed for any kind of knockout blow against France, and had the goal of simply pushing back the French forces and taking over some amount of territory, which was in line with Hitler's instructions and the believed capabilities of the German forces. At this early stage, the germ of the eventual plan was already present, though, because there were two armored divisions positioned further to the south, with one position to attack through the Ardennes, while another focused on attacking the very northern section of the Maginot Line. When these plans were presented to Hitler, he was not very impressed. The attacks were not exactly the kind of bold plan that Hitler often liked to see. And in the case of these early drafts, he's not wrong. It's important to state that these plans were not a a mirror of the Schlieffen plan from before the First World War, involving kind of a wide-sweeping attack through Belgium and towards Paris, but they did share that earlier plan's starting point, an attack into Belgium. The risks of this plan would be emphasized after there was a war scare in France in mid-January, which would see the French army put into readiness for a march into Belgium. This seemed to confirm to the Germans that a major part of the French plan was to concentrate forces exactly onto where they were planning to attack. This information 
would have both short and long-term ramifications. On the short term, the next version of the planned attack would increase the number of armored divisions in the Ardennes from 1 to 2, so that they could advance on Sedan and ensure the protection of the German left flank. This would be incorporated into the third major draft, which was presented uh, on January 30th. On a longer time frame, the information gained in mid-January would play a major role in a complete shift in German planning, a change that had really been building since the very first draft for the attack was presented in October. Hitler had never been pleased with the conservative nature of the plans, a frustration that was just amplified by the fact that he felt that the army leaders were sort of to blame for the delay of the attack until the spring of 1940, instead of it being launched in October or November of 1939, when he had really wanted it to happen. And now he wanted a more radical and aggressive plan, and it would be provided by a man who would become one of the most famous German generals of the war, Erich von Manstein. Manstein was, in early 1940, the chief of staff of Army Group A. Army Group A was not the primary point of German emphasis and was instead positioned along the area to the south, along the border of Luxembourg and the Ardennes Forest. From the period starting in roughly October 1939 through the end of January, Manstein would write up seven memorandums outlining the plan that he believed that the German military should use in its attack on France. During this time, he would be able to consult with General Heinz Guderian, who was the commander of the armored forces assigned to Army Group A. They would have their headquarters in adjacent hotels, and this allowed them to have several conversations over the months, with Guderian being one of Germany's leading armored warfare theorists and, and practitioners. This was important because Manstein's plan was nothing less than a complete rewrite of what General Halder at German High Command was proposing. Instead of making the main effort through central Belgium, Manstein wanted to use that area simply as a diversion, playing on preconceived notions of the French leaders. The focal point of the German attack would instead shift south, with the majority of Germany's armored divisions being pushed through the Ardennes as quickly as possible. Once they were on the other side of the forest, they would advance on the Meuse at Sedan, cross the river, and then continue to push forward. The goal was not just to capture territory, but to try and isolate some of the French and British forces in Belgium to prevent them from reacting to the German attack. Guderian would offer his advice to Manstein in two ways. The first was that Guderian believed that the German armored units absolutely could advance through the Ardennes, an area that Guderian had experience with, including during fighting during the First World War. The second was that he pushed Manstein to make the crossing of the Meuse River at the earliest possible moment in the attack. Guderian believed that it needed to be completed by the fifth day of the attack because every hour between the start of the attack and the crossing of the river was another hour that f the French could move reinforcements into the area around Sedan and greatly increase the difficulty of the crossing. These changes would largely be integrated into Manstein's future drafts. But such a radical change was not supported, at least initially, by General Halder, and he would move to minimize Manstein's influence by promoting him out of the way. This meant that on January 27th, von Manstein would be promoted to command an infantry corps, but it was one that did not exist and was still being organized. But it served Halder's purpose of giving him out of being the chief of staff of Army Group A. Just before he left his post at Army Group A, Manstein arranged a set of war games that confirmed the basic ideas of his plans, and at this point even Halder was beginning to shift his thinking, although he was resistant to giving Manstein credit. It's very possible that this change of plan, Manstein's change in plans, could have ended with his promotion out of Army Group A. But Manstein would have the support of Hitler's military adjutant, uh, Rudolf Schmundt. Schmunt had visited Army Group A's headquarters in January, which resulted in him hearing of Manstein's plans. He would then meet with Manstein in early February after his transfer, and during their conversation, Manstein would provide further details of what he'd kind of worked out over the previous weeks, and criticisms of what was being proposed by Halder and the German High Command up to that point. Schmunt would tell uh, another member of Hitler's military staff that one of the reasons he kept meeting with Manstein is that he felt that what Manstein was proposing was exactly what Hitler wanted, 
And Schmunt wanted to be the one to bring this plan, or the person who had this plan, to Hitler. Due to this belief, Schmunt would take the next step of trying to get Manstein in a position to present his ideas to Hitler directly. First, he would outline Manstein's plans for Hitler, and then he would invite Manstein as part of a larger meeting between Hitler and some of the newly promoted corps commanders, including Manstein. Then after the meeting, Hitler and Manstein had a direct conversation, and by the time that that conversation was over, Hitler was more than convinced that moving the focus of the German attack to the south was the correct path forward. Manstein had the benefit that his plan played right into the types of operations that Hitler loved, bold actions that would catch the enemy off guard. There were risks, especially around the possibility of French flank attacks, but Manstein, even more than Hitler, believed that these risks were worth it, and that the speed of their action would prevent a proper French reaction from taking place. Fortunately for Holder, he had already been working on his own version of Manstein's plan, which retained the high-level objectives of Manstein's suggestions with the shift of German effort to the south. But there were some key differences between the Manstein version of the plan and Halder's. Halder's changes would be represented in the fourth major revision of Fall Gelb, the case yellow for the attack on France. There were very important differences between the two plans, though especially around the speed of the planned advance and the final objectives of the attack. Within the German army leadership, there was a fundamental difference of opinion about how quickly certain military objectives could be accomplished in the new world of armored warfare. On one side, you had men like Guderian, who believed that he could cross the Meuse in five days, or even less, While on the other, you had men like Halder, who took a more conservative approach to the plan, believing that instead, it would only be on the 9th or 10th day that the Germans could realistically cross the river. One of the reasons that Halder believed that it would take so much longer was due to the difference in speed between the armored and infantry forces. Guderian believed, as Guderian would almost always believe, that all he needed was his panzer divisions, and he wanted to go as quickly as possible. But Halder believed that the Meuse could only be crossed after the infantry arrived at the river to assist in the crossing. If this was the case, then the difference in days between when Guderian and Manstein believed that the river could be crossed and when Halder believed it could be done was almost entirely down to how long it would take the foot-slogging German infantry to be in position. This then greatly impacted what both groups thought they could achieve after the river was crossed with Manstein believing that the objective of the German attack should be to use their armored forces to push on as hard and as fast as possible, all the way to the North Sea coast if if they can make it, cutting off any French and British troops to their north. Halder initially took a more conservative approach, although he would eventually be convinced to seek out more distant objectives, although these differences in opinions about how fast and how far the attack should be executed would continue after it had been launched. We'll be talking about it for several episodes. While I have been focusing on Halder as well, who was the chief of the general staff and who was ultimately responsible for the performance of a plan, it's worth taking a moment to say that Halder was not the only voice of concern among the German military, with other leading officers also voicing his same concerns, primarily around how the plan went against some of the sort of basic tenets of military operations. I will just focus on two of these here. The first sort of person who voiced concerns was General von Bock, the commander of Army Group B. Although his perspective is slightly muddied by the fact that he was the commander that was losing his central place in the German offensive, he had previously been the focal point of the entire German effort, and now he would just be a distraction. But regardless, the feedback that he would give towards the plan was, quote, You will be creeping 10 miles from the Maginot Line with the flank of your breakthrough, and the hope of the French will watch inertly. You are cramming the mass of the tank units together into the sparse roads of the Ardennes mountain country, as if there were no such thing as air power. And you then hope to be able to lead an operation as far as the coast, with an open southern flank 200 miles long, where stands the mass of the French army? End quote. In a similar vein, the commander of Army Group B, General von Rundstedt, who had originally been a supporter of Manstein's plan, would begin to preach caution as the day approached. His views were echoed by his chief of staff, General Soderstern, 
who would write on February 22nd that, quote, I'm not convinced that even the reinforced panzer and motorized units will manage to force the crossing over the Meuse in the kind of breadth that is necessary for operational purposes. Yes, I, I doubt, to begin with, that they will be in a position to cross the Meuse River even only here and there, holding the bridgeheads thus gained until the following infantry division would be able to make room for an operational exploitation featuring the necessary breadth and depth. But even if that should come off successfully, the panzer and motorized units by that time will be so exhausted that sending them deep into enemy rear areas will no longer offer any chance of success. End quote. In both cases, the skeptical German officers were concerned primarily about the French reaction to the German attack. They would claim that those who favored the aggressive plan were underestimating the French army. But as it would turn out, even the most optimistic of German plans was probably still actually overestimating the ability of the French to react to the situation that they were about to be in. And that's why, looking back sort of with, with hindsight, some of these more conservative German generals seem too conservative. They seem um, to kind of be out of step with where warfare was in May 1940. But so much of that comes down to the fact that the French just did not react correctly. And so these generals were assuming that the French would react competently or they would react in the same way that the German leaders would. And if they would have, if they would have been able to put together a coherent response to what was about to happen, then there were real risks to the German plans. The French were just unable to sort of take advantage of any of those risks to put the German units in a bad position. And it would really be telling over the course of the campaign. And so history would prove that men like Manstein and Guderian, these with these really bold and aggressive plans, were right. They were advocating for the correct path for the German military in their attack on France. But in February and January and March 1940, it seemed far less certain that they would be successful. The disagreements that developed after February 1940 were largely based about what would happen at the Meuse and after, not about the path to get there. And so all the staff officers in Army Group A got to work on planning their path to the Meuse. This planning would be critical because Army Group A, made up of 45 divisions, including 7 Panzer divisions and 3 motorized infantry divisions, would be arrayed on 90 kilometers of front, and they had to move through the Ardennes. The 7 Panzer divisions would lead the way, but even these troops could not all move through the area at one time. There simply were not enough roads. And the traffic situation would be a disaster, even under the best of circumstances. But as they began to finalize these movement plans, they were detailed, they were precise, then discussions had to start happening about what they would do after. Manstein had pushed for a much larger second phase of the campaign, with one group of mobile divisions pushing as fast as possible for the Channel Coast, while another set of forces quickly began a southern attack against the theoretically largely unguarded areas of northern France. The second attack would eventually become the second phase of the German offensive, Case Red, but it was decided that it would only occur after the first phase of the operation was complete and the, and the Allied forces in the north were dealt with. This would allow the mobile and infantry forces of the German advance to be in place for the expected French counterattack on the German left with the assumption being that it could be possible for the French to get together up to 40 divisions from their reserve and from other areas of the front to launch a counterattack to try and re-establish a connection with the troops in the north. With the German plan mostly settled on, the next question was what forces would they have to execute that plan? From the end of the invasion of Poland, the German military had spent the phony war rebuilding its forces and enhancing them in many ways. But all these efforts were hampered by the relatively low degree of industrial mobilization that would be the hallmark of the German war effort during these early years. This resulted in a far smaller output than what would be present in later years, and the output that was present was also structured and planned in a way that 
I guess is interesting in hindsight. For example, the overall output of German industry was not geared towards winning a short war in France, but instead around the possibility of a much longer war. The clearest indicator of this is the fact that the output of ammunition and other supplies was not scheduled to peak until October 1940, months after the start of the French campaign. There was also a heavy emphasis being placed on ammunition production, and more importantly, the capacity to produce more ammunition in the future. In the German war economy, the allocation of steel was a precise indicator of the priorities within German industry, and in the second quarter of 1940, during which the invasion of France would occur, there was just as much steel being allocated to the increase in possible future production of ammunition as there was towards tanks. They were just as concerned about what they would do with ammunition in the future than they were about tanks, which would be useful for the opening French attacks in May 1940. Along with an emphasis that was out of step with what the military plans were, with the military having now planned for a lightning attack against France that they hoped would quickly end the war, not result in a long, drawn-out struggle, there was also many challenges at sort of the leadership level of the German economy. In 1945, George Thomas, the chief of the war economy staff, would analyze this period of time by saying, quote, There was complete leaderlessness in the economic field in Hitler's so-called Fuhrer state, and there was an unspeakably confused parallelism because Hitler did not grasp the need for firm, far-sighted planning, because Goering knew nothing about the economy and economics, and because the responsible experts had no real authority. End quote. These challenges, though, did not prevent the construction of a good amount of new and improved military hardware. This would allow the equipment lost in Poland to be replaced, along with the expansion in several areas of the German military. One example of this would be the Luftwaffe with its new Ju-88 bomber, which would be just one part of the very large number of bombers created during the Phony War, with around 1,600 of the 2,100 aircraft built during this period being bombers. The Ju-88 was a major improvement over the previous version of German bombers, and had been available only in limited numbers during the Polish campaign, and would have a much bigger presence in the skies over France. Within the German armored units, the availability of newer tanks was also important. Almost immediately after the Polish campaign, some of the panzer divisions transferred to western Germany and began to receive replacement tanks. Efforts were also started to transition the four light divisions that had been present in Poland into fully-fledged panzer divisions. The light divisions had been a concept built around the use of trucks to haul tanks around the campaign, allowing for greater mobility. However, the concept had not really worked out during the Polish campaign, with the massive number of trucks required to move the light divisions, reducing the number of trucks available for other purposes, and the German leaders just didn't feel like this was worth it. Therefore, during the Phony War, these divisions were transitioned into standard panzer divisions and became panzer divisions 6, 7, 8, and 9. This expansion of the number of panzer divisions was only possible due to the increased production of some of the newer tank models, including a large number of tanks built in the Skoda works in Czechoslovakia. These Czech tanks, the 35T and the 38T, would be critical components of the German armored units all the way up to Barbarossa in June 1941. But across all panzer divisions, there would be fewer of the older tanks like the Panzer I's, the, the light tanks with only machine guns, and a higher number of Panzer III's and IVs, both modern designs with larger guns and far more armor, and far more able to sort of match up against the latest Allied tanks. A new type of vehicle would also be ready in the spring of 1940, the Stug III assault gun. The Stug and its later variants would go on to be the most produced German fully tracked vehicle of the war, and the concept was pretty simple. It took the chassis of a Panzer III tank, but instead of mounting a turret on top, a 7.5 centimeter howitzer was mounted directly to the hull. This reduced the time and materials needed to uh, actually manufacture the vehicle, while still providing a mobile piece of artillery that could be used to support the infantry with both fire support and anti-tank capabilities. The lack of a turret made hitting moving targets more difficult, but the volume that could be manufactured was felt to be more than worth the compromise. Eventually, over 10,000 Stug 3s would be built, making it a critical component of the German war effort for basically the rest of the war, even if it wasn't as flashy as some of those cool tanks that they would make in later years. 
All was not perfect with the mobile divisions of the German army, though, as there would be a change that would only sort of grow in the years that followed. During the Phony War period, three months worth of production capacity for large trucks was given not to the army and its motorized units, but instead to new Waffen-SS units that wanted to motorize some of their troops. This reduced the motor transport of the army units and instead handed it over to the Waffen-SS divisions that were far less experienced and had not received the education of combat in Poland. It would begin at this point with trucks, but later changes in tank allocations and other critical equipment would play a role in sort of reducing the overall fighting power of some German armored forces in Russia and then moving that over to Waffen-SS divisions, which would kind of be a theme for the rest of the war. Nothing could change the fact that the Germans were in a pretty good position in the West. There were a total of 135 German divisions either involved in the attacks in the West or in reserve, with the majority of these being in Army Group A's sector, which had 45 divisions under its command. This allowed the Germans to reach something sort of approaching numerical parity with the Allies, with around 151 Allied divisions, but these were spread across four national armies, including the Belgian and Dutch armies that were technically neutral at the start of hostilities, so coordination would not be very good. But the exact positioning of the divisions on both sides would actually be almost more important than how many there specifically were, with the focus on the German attack in the Army Group A sector through the Ardennes matching 45 divisions against just 18 French and Belgian divisions. At the same time in the north, Army Group B, with 29 German divisions, would face 45 Allied divisions, although these Allied divisions were focused on a defensive strategy and did not plan to launch their own offensive against Germany. This kind of put the Germans in, in a better spot than they would have otherwise been, simply because they picked a specifically weak area to focus most of their efforts, which gave them a numerical advantage at what they saw as the critical spot. Next episode, we will begin to discuss what the Germans would do with all of these divisions. Starting in the north with the invasion of the Netherlands, a neutral nation that could not hope to completely stop the German invasion, but did hope to be able to hold out long enough for help to arrive. <laughs>